the voice cast in this is really, really good. I think it was cool that they were able to bring in Sam Jackson, even though he did maybe two, three lines worth of dialogue. And then Christopher Lee came back as Count Dooku, which was fabulous. And then the the voice actors they bring in, especially James Arnold Taylor, who does Obi-Wan, I thought was fabulous. Like, he really captures that Ewan McGregor spirit. Ewan McGregor is my favorite part of the prequels because he has so much life and energy. And I thought that uh, Tom, uh, James Arnold Taylor did a really good job of ca- capturing that. And he does have that, like, little Obi-Wan smirkiness that we got in the prequels. Now, when we, when we see in the original trilogy, Obi-Wan, he's kind of defeated and demoralized and old but what i liked about uh, about obi-wan in the prequels and, and in this too he's got a little a little spunk to him a little a little spirit yeah he was really fun and i you know i was glad to see him be a major part of it which which we kind of knew he was gonna be they did some neat little character things i thought too with some of the newer characters they introduced just just little things ahsoka's lightsaber style she holds her lightsabers underhand which was really just kind of yeah. unique and interesting and something that it I didn't notice until about halfway through, but I, I thought that was kind of fun. I like how they vary the clones a little. They have different haircuts and some different styles, which makes them look a little more individualized. I mean, mostly they're cannon fodder in this movie, but they're starting to show them as kind of individual characters that you might empathize with a little bit. So I thought that was important. They even had kind of traditional military things, like they had painted a blue woman on the side of one of their star cruisers, like you saw in World War II bombers. You know, they refer to the droid armies as clankers, which I thought was kind of fun. So there's lots of little things like that that I liked, and I think you're spot on with the action sequences. I think they're really fun. You had climbing up the wall of the monastery, which I really enjoyed. I liked the energy shield opening bits where they can't penetrate the droid energy shield, so they kind of have to go into the energy shield and wait for them to come to them and then attack. I thought that was great. And then I also think you missed the absolute say what you will about ahsoka tano and and her portrayal in this movie i forgive a lot because i know what that character turns into and it's something that i absolutely love but she gave the greatest line maybe in any star wars movie oh oh my goodness what is it they are on tatooine and they are trying to bring back they have java's son they're trying to bring him back they're going through the desert and she's asking anakin some type of question and he says he doesn't want to talk about that. And she replies, what would you rather talk about? Sand? And I <laughs> almost lost it. I, I thought that was amazing. I was like, I don't care what the rest of this movie does. The fact that you just ripped on him whining about sand in the prequels is amazing. So I, I was really happy with that. There are, there, are, I, there are good things to draw out of this movie. I know the section we talk about next is probably going to be longer, but there are, there are some good things to pull out of here. So now we're going to get to the bad. First, the animation. The animation, especially when you go right into the Clone Wars cartoon, the animation of the movie is worse than the cartoon. Like, straight up. So that's one of the things that I didn't like. It's true. Uh, the amount of blaster fire distracts from the tension. And this is a problem I have with the cartoon series as well. It is so over the top with the amount of blaster fire. It really ruins a lot of the tension. Think back to the original trilogy. The Millennium Falcon's trying to get away. There weren't 8 billion blaster bolts hitting it and shooting it and missing it. It was chase, chase, fire, hit... Um, it was much more nuanced and intention filled. I mean, I, there's no other way to describe it. This was a bigger story, though. I mean, most of the Millennium Falcon is one plane being chased by a couple of TIE fighters, where this is hundreds of soldiers in a ground battle. But I do think it was a little much. The other thing they did in the same aspect in those scenes that annoyed me, which I think is a really cliche trope now, is they used the shaky cam, like mm-hmm. you saw in the Saving Private Ryan battle sequence. Which, I'm just tired of that effect. You don't need to do it. We we get what's going on to, to do that. It's almost like, the only thing they were missing was also having some type of liquid hit the lens of the camera. Those are the, the two battle sequence things that just annoy the crap out of me, and this is something that did that well, right away. Then think, I mean, to defend my point, think about Return of the Jedi. Return of the Jedi is a gigantic space, space battle with lots of shooting, but there was still ability to follow it. And I think with the way the Clone Wars does is it's above and beyond. And it makes it so that it's so distracting. There's so much blaster fire. You can't follow what's actually occurring. Whereas in Return of the Jedi, even though it's the same sort of situation, you can. I just want a little bit less blaster fire. And I feel like over the course of the next 8 billion episodes that we do, that's going to be a continual critique of mine. Suffers from the same problem that the prequels do. The droids are just silly. 
and the jokiness of them is suffocating and it's clones versus robots there's a detachment you know the droids are droids aren't scary like stormtroopers are in in the other movies there's an idea of like the fear well the droids aren't scary like i said and i don't know i just there's no humanity in it so i i disagree on this point this is a kid's show and a kid's movie so i don't think you necessarily need all of the fodder to be terrifying like you saw in some of the movies, which I think were aimed a little bit older. I know Lucas says they're all for kids. But but Star Wars is an older-themed movie, the original ones. Their jokiness didn't bother me. I actually thought it was the appropriate level of it. And I like that they started to individualize the clones. I think they could have done more of it. But they did start to add nuance and humanity to some of them, which I think makes us a little more sympathetic to them. So I hope they build on that as they, the series goes. Yeah. But I think there are dark characters in here, too. Ventress is a very dark character, both in her concept, her actions, and things she does. Dooku is as well. We know we're going to get General Grievous. We know we're going to get darker characters that are involved in this. So I think the droids are a nice balance of still being fun for kids and providing for me the right amount of levity and still having those other dark elements of the bad guys that you can draw on. What annoyed me from a joke standpoint that didn't land a lot is Anakin and Ahsoka's banter and all the poop jokes going along with Jabba's son because they find Jabba's son in this monastery and he's a baby and it, they call him stinky and punky muffin and you know talk about how he smells and all those type of things that is the joking that just did not land to me and I couldn't wait to get through well I think what you bring up leads me into my next point is this movie can't decide what it is you talk about it as if it's a kid's movie and then Anakin will be looking for a place to, pl- to land his ship. He's about to land his ship, and then all of a sudden it gets blo- the hangar gets blown up and all these clones die, and immediately we cut to a joke. It's, it's a kid's movie, and then all of a sudden we're slicing and dicing through all these people and showing death. And it just, it's so, the tone is so uneven, it can't decide what it is. And maybe that's a problem with George Lucas as a whole. I don't know, but I know that was a problem for me in this movie. That's 100% correct. Uh, and not just that they, they blew up the clones, they show you the severed heads of bounty hunters... There is, uh, it turns out not to be true, but they would lead you to believe that Dooku sliced the baby Jabba in half, and then it's a fake out and it isn't actually him. But there is some intense dark stuff here that doesn't strike a chord then with Punky Muffin, you're so smelly type jokes that are going on. It, It is a very weirdly designed movie as to who they're trying to appeal to. They didn't find a balance. And they put in some for adults and some for kids, but it's not a Pixar movie where they found that blend where neither realizes it's happening. So that is a disappointment. I think we should probably talk about Padme. Padme was, at least to me, totally shoehorned into this movie just because it was like halfway through the movie, oh, we haven't used Padme, but better get her in there. And I thought the entire thing... You could have taken her out of the movie and it wouldn't it wouldn't have mattered me with minor minor changes. What are your thoughts on Padme? I, I have a theory on this that you basically hit on the head. So for those of you that haven't seen it, an hour and 15 minutes into an hour and 40 minute movie, Padme suddenly shows up on Coruscant and it goes on a side plot mission where she gets captured by Jabba's uncle. Zero. Zero the Hut, And then some clones come and save her. The mood of that scene is completely different than everything else in the movie. It feels like something out of nowhere that doesn't fit. My theory is that they originally wrote and cut this movie and realized they were 15 minutes short. And they made that and put it in. Because like you said, if you took it out, it wouldn't affect anything at all. None of what she does matters with anything. If it was intentional, then we probably would have seen her spaced out throughout the movie and had her story spaced out throughout the movie. But she, she comes in in the last half hour and goes on her own side adventure with Anthony Daniels. I, what, what's the point of that? It was forced in and then it, it leads into Zero the Hut, which is... Offensive? Offensive. Okay. Yeah. It, it's <laughs> offensive. It's, it's a gay stereotype. Right. And, and I, I looked online and I found, if you're familiar with the Logo channel, which is a Viacom station, it's still around, but it was originally a LGBT-focused channel. Now I think it's just kind of a home lifestyle channel. They came out and and had some quotes from the director of the movie saying that Zero Zero the Hut was was brought into this movie and he was originally only supposed to speak the Jabba the Hut language, Huttonese or whatever they call it, which even that term is a little weird coming from Lucas with his other characters. But if you see the movie, he is very obviously Truman Capote imitation. He has pink feathers and face makeup and all this stuff on rather effeminate gestures and what the director says 
Dave Filoni is that he was original David Filoni. He was originally speaking in this this hut language, and then George Lucas saw dailies and said, "No, make him sound like Truman Capote." And that was when they flipped the character to this, which is a really unfortunate choice. The character design was unfortunate as well. And it's hard to give them the benefit of the doubt when you had Jar Jar Binks, when you had the Trade Federation, yeah. when you had Watto, mm -hmm. who are very obviously racial stereotypical characters. Whether Lucas meant to be offensive, he probably didn't. But this is just another unfortunate dart in that column. So to throw that in with the whole nonsense of having Padme in the movie at all, it's a real, it's a real bad section of movie. The one last thing that I want to talk about as far as the bad before we get to our final thoughts here is Ahsoka. And I felt like she could dip too far into that stereotype of the angsty teen rather than be a full-fledged character that she's later in the series. And I want to get your thoughts on that. I did not like Ahsoka other than this is where we meet Ahsoka. There are some things I like about Ahsoka in this. I think if I didn't know where she was going, I'd probably feel the, the similar feelings that you have about her in this character. She has a good conversation with Rex, who's also another fun character they introduced, who's a leader of the clone trooper army, who's going to play a more prominent role as things progress. But she has a really good conversation with him where she's this teenage kid who kind of shows up and basically tells him, hey, I'm a Jedi, so basically I'm your boss, right? And he kind of says to her, I think experience is the best boss. And I, I liked that. It's subtle. It's not a long moment. But to me, it kind of touched on the failings of the Jedi as a whole, as we've seen throughout the course of the movie, and kind of their entitlement. She's born into being a Jedi, and basically born into a position of elevation against them. And that's the reason why they're going to fall in not too long after these series, this movie and these, this series is because of some of that privilege and entitlement that they see in themselves. So I thought some of those things were interesting. I'm not sure if they were intentional or not, but they were things that I took out of them that I liked. She was bratty, which didn't serve the purpose as much as I would have liked if they were going to go that route. I also wondered what type of Jedi is going to be fighting droids in a tube top and miniskirt. It was a weird combo choice that went uh, very much in line with the weird cleavage that Ventress is showing in her outfit as well. So I wish some of those character designs were a little bit stronger as far as having female viewers who want to watch this. I mean, it's ridiculous to have a someone fighting in a tube top and miniskirt in, in a, 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 a military style setting. It just doesn't make any sense. But I do think there were some good things about her and it is going to get better at least. All right, guys, so that is our review on the Clone Wars movie. We'll hit up in our next episode, the first episode of the Clone Wars animated show, which came out, I think, six months after uh, the movie was released. I could be wrong. Three about months. That. Three months. I'm sorry, three months. October was the movie, and or excuse me, August was the movie. October then was the show. It was that quick? Okay, I thought for some reason that it was released earlier, like in, in March or so. So before we go here, what other nerd stuff are you looking forward to? Mr. Neitzel. Well, I'm going to tell you about something I just finished watching. Have you heard of Dark? It's a German show on Netflix. Have you seen that I've at heard, all? I've heard advertising for it. I, I haven't watched it. It was really fun. I ended up, I think it's only six or eight episodes, and I probably watched them in three days because I, I couldn't stop. Uh, so anytime I had a free moment, I was putting it in there. It is a mystery in a small German town. A kid goes missing and it kind of brings together the lives of three families that are interconnected and it shows them through different times in their history so it's generational there are some sci-fi elements to it it's very twin peaks without the humor part to it but i really really enjoyed it it's really fun it goes places i wasn't expecting which is always nice but if you do check it out on netflix the one thing i recommend is your netflix is going to default to dubbing which is awful Put it in the original German and turn on the subtitles, and it is it is an amazing watch. So check that out. It's Dark on Netflix. Awesome. Dark. I've, I've heard of it. I'll look into it for sure. For me, everything is about Black Panther right now. One of my favorite comic book characters. It's got one of my favorite actors in Michael B. Jordan, and I'm excited for that movie. So with that, that's it. That's the first one. For Luke Neitzel, I'm Maya Madrid, and we've been Kid. Seriously. Take it easy. <laughs>
You can also follow us on Twitter at Kids Seriously. Until next time.